This wasn't my most productive summer, I'm afraid. I've got a couple projects stuck in the prototyping phase, and another couple that are really more about learning a skill than ending up with a fancy photogenic result. But I have been knocking out some shop improvements in the meantime, which are hopefully interesting enough to justify this video. Nothing major, just little snack projects like last time. Sometimes those can be enough. One of the things I picked up on my cross-country road trip earlier this year was a ratcheting arbor press. I had been looking to upgrade mine for some time, mostly because it wasn't a ratcheting model. That means the lever arm is directly geared to the quill. If one moves, the other moves. Simple enough, but the problem is, is that when you want to really crank down on the lever, there is a very limited range of angles in which you can apply full force. Anything outside of that range gets awkward and less efficient. There are some solutions to this, like what this old Tony covered in a recent video. But mostly you just end up making stacks of scrap to lift the part to a height which keeps the arm in a good position. It works, but it's precarious and annoying. I love Seattle, but our supply of used machine tools? It's not the best, and we don't even have Boeing surplus around anymore. So I was checking listings on the usual suspects every night of the road trip, and ended up finding this Famco 4-ton ratcheting arbor press when passing through Denver. I managed to get it into the bike to take it up to the shop, but my back had some rather loud opinions about the wisdom of lifting it out again. Luckily, Crane. Upon setting it up, it was immediately obvious I should have bought one years ago. The ratcheting is absolutely worth the extra money. It just makes everything about the process better. It was in good condition, too. I mildly improved the lever arm by cutting a flat for the set screw, finding an actual set screw instead of the random bolt it came with, and adding this bicycle handlebar grip just for fun. I was very happy with the purchase. Except, what it really needed was a plate. These are what your part actually sits on, and they have a series of slots of different widths cut into them, for when you're pushing something through and out of the part, like a keyway brooch. The slots give it a way to fall through, with the different sizes there to support parts of different widths as best as possible. That's also why the fab table has a slot cut there. Unfortunately, the plate for my new one had been lost at some point in its previous history. That's part of why it was such a good deal. So, oh no, I was going to have to fabricate an interesting part out of a big lump of steel. How terrible! For comparison, this is the plate off my old arbor press. Looks okay until you turn it over and realize it's made of Swiss cheese. I was pretty sure I could do better than that, at least. Never having made one before, I spent some time modeling it in CAD and testing cardboard versions of it. The exact sizes of the slots and holes was dictated primarily by the tooling I had available, but I think it ended up being a pretty good spread. I particularly liked adding the holes in between the slots, which I hadn't seen before looking around for ideas for this project. It started with a round cutoff I found on eBay, which remains a surprisingly good source for random bits of metal. It's 4130 steel, sometimes called chromoly, which is a nicely tough and hard-wearing alloy. It takes a bit more time to machine, but for a working surface like this that I don't want to get too dinged up, it seemed like a good choice. I first screwed up the two opposing faces, then drilled and counterbored the mounting hole in the center. With that done, I could screw it down to a big piece of scrap aluminum held in the truck and clean up the edges. The good thing about this arrangement is that if it starts to slip, it's in the direction that will tend to tighten the screw down harder. And that's good, because cutting that far out means higher torque on the part, just from the increased lever arm. I didn't have any problems, though, and I could test the blank on the arbor press to make sure it was looking good. And then it was mill time. There wasn't anything tricky about the machining, it was just a lot of material to remove. So the first step was to use drills and hole saws as much as possible. I saw someone once say that if you need to remove material, do as much as possible on the bandsaw, with twist drills being a close second. I went in the opposite order here, but the point stands. Once the holes were drilled, I cut the slot to the smallest one before removing it from the mill table. This meant I would have a convenient, straight, axis-aligned edge against which to indicate, letting me mount it back on the mill after the bandsaw work in exactly the same orientation. Cutting out the bulk of the slot material on the bandsaw went well, and is the kind of operation that makes me glad I went to all the effort needed to get that behemoth in here. With that done, I was able to mill away the last of the material on the slots, and it was done. A quick application of bluing so it won't rust too unpleasantly, and the new arbor press was properly integrated into its new home. And the plate spins so well! Spinny spin spin spin! Some time ago I learned about the existence of definite length tape measures. 
I think Laura Kampf used one in a video, but I can't find it now. Anyway, you push a button and a defined, repeatable length of tape comes out. There are digital ones now, of course, but they were originally mechanical, and that sounded pretty cool. So naturally I got one. It's often quite convenient to be able to grab some tape one-handed, so it's been a nice little addition to the shop. Except there were some problems with it. And one night when I managed to drag myself out to the shop despite not having a big project going on, I fixed them. Problem one. The lever didn't always return all the way up, particularly on shorter strokes. I figured either the mechanism needed cleaning or the spring had gotten pulled out of shape. So I took it apart to figure out. With it open, you can see the business end more clearly. When I first got it, I expected the tape to come out from between these two rollers, but that isn't how it works at all. They aren't counter-rotating, they're co-rotating, both driven by the same gear but with different ratios. The tape comes down over the top roller, but the lower one is rotating a bit faster. The tape can't stick to both of them at the same time, so it gets kicked out at the transition point. And I just think that's a really clever way to handle dealing with a sticky material like tape. Anyway, the spring looked fine, so I cleaned the mechanism. Which I probably would have done anyway once I was in there. The 50-year-old grease was noticeably tacky, and the motion on some of the mechanisms was quite stiff. So it wasn't too much of a surprise when the good lube job had it working again. Just remember, kids, only ever oil the pivots, not the gear teeth themselves, unless it's in a sealed environment like a gearbox. Oil traps dust, and dust isn't abrasive. Particularly in my environment. Problem 2. This plate that shows the current setting was rattling around loose on the shaft. I straightened it out some and added a washer behind it to take the slack out of the system. Easy. Problem 3. The adjustment is not designed to be super easy to operate. I think these are usually used in warehouse packaging contexts, where some efficiency expert with a stopwatch has figured out the exact right length of tape down to the millimeter or something. I'm not too worried about my monthly tape budget, so I'd rather be able to quickly adjust it on the fly, without needing a screwdriver to do so. Plus, the old screw was chewed up and nasty. Solution? Make a replacement thumb screw. It couldn't be too big or else it would interfere with the lever, so I grabbed a piece of aluminum hex stock and created the thumb half of a thumb screw on the lathe. As I often do in this situation, the screw half was a commercial screw, cut off and loctited in place. This means I can have the convenience of turning aluminum with the wear resistance of a steel screw. Plus, I think it ends up looking a lot nicer than a thread cut with a die would be. And it works great! This is the blast cabinet I bought soon after moving into this shop space. It came from the estate sale of a brilliant Boeing machinist who had built an intricate, hyper-customized shop for himself. This folding step on the side was there to access some hyper-customized storage mounted above it. It's been nice to have, but I never used it as much as I expected, and I haven't been using it at all recently, due to it no longer reliably blasting the media like it's supposed to. There was always a flow of air coming out of the nozzle, but then when I tried to trigger the full flow, not much happened. And then a need came up recently for blasting of media, so I figured now is the time to finally figure out what's going on. So here's what I found. The foot treadle opens this pneumatic valve, which releases pressure on this line, letting this other pneumatic valve on the main line open, placed just after the media hopper. My suspicion was focused on that main valve. Why is it right after the media injection port? Wouldn't that lead to media jamming up the valve's action over time? That had always seemed pretty weird to me, but I've learned enough humility at this point in life to admit that sometimes things that look weird to me actually have a good reason behind them. Pretty often, actually, so I opened it up to take a closer look. Turns out it was a diaphragm valve. This totally makes sense. Diaphragm valves can handle a wide array of nasty, chunky, corrosive fluids just fine. One of their main uses is in sewage systems. The diaphragm being there means that the working fluid never even comes in contact with the delicate valve mechanisms, making them very resilient. The pressure from the foot treadle line comes in at the top and pushes down on this rubber diaphragm, blocking the flow. When that pressure is released by stepping on the treadle, the diaphragm can pop back up and let the air and media through. Then when you let up on the treadle, pressure comes back into the top, pushing the diaphragm back down and the main flow gets cut off again. But the diaphragm itself felt like it had hardened with age, so maybe that was the trouble. Unfortunately, finding replacement diaphragms for this valve was not trivial. I did find one on eBay, but it had the brass fitting for a mechanical linkage instead of pneumatic pressure. But I figured it was worth a try. 
It didn't arrive until after my particular need for the blast cabinet had already passed, but I still put it in to see how it did, and that was not great. It was worse than the original diaphragm, actually. So, blast. But, in the meantime, I'd had this problem simmering in the back of my mind for a couple of weeks at this point, and I'd begun to wonder something. If the pressure on the backside of the diaphragm is supposed to hold it closed against the mainline pressure, then there must only be a limited range of relative pressures for which that'll work, or else the valve would never open at all, or the mainline pressure would just force its way through. And thinking it over, I couldn't say for certain if I'd messed with the blast cabinet's internal regulator since getting it, and I had definitely messed with the pressure on the shop's air system. So I put the old diaphragm back in and started tweaking pressures. And yeah, turns out that had been the problem all along. The blast cabinet was working again. Except. There was another reason I had never used it as much as I had expected, and that was that it was a literal pain to use. I'm not a particularly tall person, one of the rare men happy enough not to round himself up to six foot, but there is something about the ratio of my leg to torso to arm length that means that I always want working surfaces noticeably higher than average. To use the cabinet meant standing stooped over at a really awkward angle. I always felt like a T-Rex being held in the stocks. A fix would be trivial, of course, I had just never done it. So I pulled out some of the blocking I used for moving machines around and tested it at a variety of heights. Turns out it only needed another couple of inches to be orders of magnitude more comfortable to use. I could have cut the wood to length and called it good, but like I said, I do keep it around for a specific purpose. And if I'm making a stand, why not add casters? It's plumbed into the shop's air system, so I won't be moving it around much, but even just being able to pull it out a couple inches to clean behind it would be nice. Making a stand was pretty trivial to knock out, using some of the last 2-inch angle iron left over after the gimbal maze project 10 years ago. It's a bit lazy, but I've realized that you can just weld on casters instead of messing around with the bolt holes. And it's meant I add them a lot more often now. Make sure you grind off whatever the shiny coating is first, of course. Dollars to diaphragms, that stuff isn't going to be good for the weld or your lungs. Making the sand was easy. Getting the cabinet on top of it was a bit more challenging. One of those projects that is 90% plain shop Sokoban, just to be able to lift it up by 6 inches. But there was no way I was lifting that thing up by myself, even if I had emptied the media hoppers. And there it is, a much more functional and convenient blast cabinet. Long may it blast. The last snack focused on the work rest on my belt grinder. I got it from Cleric's Metalworks in Bulgaria about 18 months ago, and I use it all the time. It's great. Except, I should have ordered the larger work rest. I thought I was saving money there, but while the small one might be fine for the main target audience of knife makers, it really is just too small for much of what I do. It's also made out of aluminum, which seems like a weird choice to me. It's already scarred, and the feeling of steel digging into a soft metal like that as I slide apart back and forth is akin to fingernails on a chalkboard. So the immediate goal was obvious. Make it bigger, make it harder. Again, I turned to 4130, this time being forced to order a custom cut. As you can see, it was going to be a significant upgrade. None of the machining was particularly hard, it just took a while because of the material and how much had to be removed. First was the tool slot along the front edge. I even drilled holes in each end like the original had, though I'm not entirely sure what they're there for. Maybe to add stops so the tool doesn't slide out? They're not threaded, though. Oh well. A little cargo coat engineering never hurt anyone. Right? Then I drilled and countersunk the mounting holes. Next was the little recess so it can tuck in around the belt, which I cut vertically to get nice crisp right angle corners. Luckily the piece was thick enough, I didn't get many bad vibrations with it mounted this way. Finally, I had to cut the big 30 degree bevels on either side. This meant knotting the mill's head down and milling away a lot of material, and then retramming the mill once I was done. But more importantly, the new work rest worked great mounted back on the belt grinder. Except, except... I did have another complaint about the design. To adjust the angle of the work rest, you need to loosen this screw, which releases a clamp on the vertical shaft. The problem is, this screw is also the axle. This is what the workrest pivots about, which means that cranking down on it to lock the workrest in place is prone to rotate the workrest, exactly the one thing you don't want to happen when locking it down. That makes getting an even moderately precise angle set quite annoying. The better solution would be to separate the pivot from the locking mechanism. 
like they did on this adjustable tool guide that came with the grinder. The pivot is here and you lock it down out here on this circular slot. So let's do what they should have done from the beginning. There are a lot of subtle geometric interactions going on here, so I first modeled it in CAD. I'm glad I did, because my default ideas would have left the sector arm interfering with the grinder belt at some of the more extreme angles. But some tweaking of the parameters here and there left me with a design I thought would work. It could adjust from slightly under horizontal up to a bit over 50 degrees. Getting any more vertical than that isn't going to be useful, since the shaft it mounts on starts to get in the way at that point. And you want to avoid tilting the work rest down into the belt much anyway. It creates a pinch point that wants to suck the piece and possibly more down into it. The machining didn't look too hard, except for possibly that curved slot, so I didn't start with that. Of course, I immediately screwed up the first part, the modifications to the shaft clamp. Wasn't paying attention and grabbed the wrong drill bit. Silly. But I'd realized some of the holes were too close together anyway, so remaking it from scratch a bit longer wasn't a bad thing. But then, on the penultimate operation, I needed to cut this slot 3.2 millimeters wider in total, or 1.6 on each side. But what I actually did was cut it 3.2 wider on each side, leaving it 3.2 too wide in total. Blast. I could have made some shims, but I would have felt them in there, laughing at me every time I used it. So I made a third, and this time, thankfully, I didn't screw up. I didn't have a slitting saw deep enough to cut this slot in the clamp, which is what lets it bend slightly to hold onto the shaft. I ordered some, but then realized it wasn't even necessary anymore with the clamping action being moved elsewhere. I just needed to be able to get it a little bit shy of snug, still free to move with a little force, but not wobbling around any. Oh well. Never a bad thing to have more slitting saws. For the shaft, I had to extend the flats and drill some new mounting holes. I ended up using the dividing head for this, just because it let me dial in the angle until the existing flat indicated as horizontal and then I could rotate it back and forth in 90 degree increments reliably. It's a standard 40 to 1 indexing head, so every 10 turns is 90 degrees. This also meant I could cut the flats with the side of an end mill, giving these nice curved transitions without needing to use a bullnose end mill in a second operation. I think it looks nicer, and hey, no stress riser. Ceteris paribus, it's just good practice to avoid making those if you can. The locking mechanism needs to screw into a hole about 40 millimeters away from the shaft in order for the geometry to work, so I needed this little offset piece. Nothing too notable about making it, other than recursively using the new work rest in order to improve the new work rest. Yay recursion! Finally, it was time for the really interesting part of the fabrication, that curved sector slot. Now, this could be done without any fancy equipment at all. I made the Stevenson reversing linkage on the unfinished steam engine project almost entirely manually, just using the mill to remove the bulk of the material, then hand filing it down to final size. And that was pretty cool, and I'm proud of the result, but like the Smeaton said, once is enough. And since then I've acquired a rotary table, so let's use that. This hole in the upper left corner is the key to the part. It's literally pivotal, being the pivot for the angle adjustment. The two to the right are just there for mounting purposes. So as long as that hole is at the center of the rotary table, all the geometry should work out just fine. The easiest way to do that is to first indicate in the rotary table itself, zero out the DRO axes at that point, and then mount the metal piece. That way I can drill the pivot hole at zero zero and know it's at the center of the rotary table. The two mounting holes are drilled along the x-axis, then starting from zero zero again, I can move down the y-axis by 50 millimeters. That puts me exactly at the left-hand end of the arc. I first drilled undersized holes just shy of each end of the slot to provide somewhere for the chips to escape through. The ends are always the most troublesome part of milling a slot. And since this was stainless steel, I didn't want to take any chances. I only had one 8mm end mill, and I really didn't want to break it. From there, I just needed to slowly lower the end mill while sweeping the rotary table back and forth by 55 degrees. Actually, not back, just forth, to account for the backlash in the gears. After each pass, I pulled the cutter up, rotated the table back past the zero point, then brought it carefully up to zero and lowered the cutter again. This way, I was always cutting with the table rotating in the same direction, so the backlash was always the same. As usual when milling a slot, I took it slow with very conservative depths of cut each pass. Slow and steady gets the goods, though. It went so well, and I had so much fun, I decided to move out another 15 millimeters and use the same setup for cutting the outside of the sector plate, so the curve would perfectly match that of the slot. 
The rest of the perimeter I freehanded, first rough cutting it to shape with an angle grinder, and then bringing it down to the line with the belt grinder. A very, very satisfying part to make. After that, I just needed to knock out another big knob so a tool wouldn't be required to adjust the angle of the work crest. Needing a tool means I won't always do it when I should, so needing a tool is bad. The knob couldn't be any larger than 40 millimeters across, or else it would hit the work rest at its most vertical. But other than that, I was mostly winging the design, following the same procedure as with the tape dispenser, but this time milling in heptagonal grooves around the perimeter for gription. And it was going great until the end mill caught and it started unscrewing off its thread, getting chewed up pretty badly in the process. I didn't want to scrap the part, though, if only because it was the last thing standing between me and finishing this video, and we were already pretty late in September for a video about summer snack projects. So I reset it on the mill, using the existing groove to clock it back to where it was, or close enough for these purposes, and continued with the grooving. This time I was careful to take shallower cuts and go extra slowly when on the edge where it was likely to grab again, and then cleaned it up on the lathe. To get the tool into the narrow clearance left available, I had to use my smallest boring bar, which meant mounting the tool upside down and running the lathe backwards. But it worked, and you can hardly tell now. And here it is all assembled. Look at how easy it is to adjust the angle. And look at how steady that angle can remain while locking it down. I would definitely recommend a mod like this to anyone with a similar problem. So that's it for this summer snack projects. I'm currently figuring out how to die sub print keycaps in bulk for a big upcoming project, Hopefully I can dive into that for real soon. I've also been exploring the art of stained glass, mostly for fun, but also for a light shade slash kinetic sculpture I'd like to make. And this beauty is now sitting around waiting its turn. Using old magneto crank phones to set up an intercom system looks to me much simpler than I would have guessed. I may have got the morbs, as the Victorian kids are saying, but watch this space. Cheers. was going to have to be forced to make an interesting part out of a big lump of steel. How terrible. Absolutely devastating. How will I survive? I might die. It's just too much. How can I do such a thing? That's impossible. I don't know what I'm going to do. It gives me a headache even thinking about it. How, how could such a terrible thing be inflicted upon me? I'm lost. Please help.